Hey everybody, this is Dan with Pain Free You. Today I have the pleasure of introducing Agnes Simzak. Did I pronounce Pretty that right? good. Yes. Not too bad. From Ontario, Canada. Uh, and Agnes reached out to me. She'd like to share her story with these mind body symptoms and her recovery process. Uh, so I'm always glad to talk to somebody new. As a matter of fact, I don't even know really what Agnes dealt with as far as symptoms go. So we'll uh, we'll both hear her story together. And um, Agnes, welcome. Really appreciate Thank you, you being willing to share your story with the world. And um, why don't you kind of tell us a little little story? Sounds good. And thank you so much for having me. Um, so my story started when I was 16 and um, I was diagnosed with scoliosis. And at that time, because of the curve, I had to have a spinal fusion surgery. I have not experienced any pain before the surgery, had no pain after the surgery. Um, I was leading pretty comfortable life as a teenager and then adolescent, not really worrying about my back or any issues. Um, and my issues really started when I started climbing the corporate ladder. So a lot of pressure at work. I had kids that I've always been very involved mom, driving from activities to activities. Um, and at that time, I started experiencing a back pain that was, um, you know, it started to become more reoccurring. It started, you know, a couple of days in a week where I felt the pain and got over the years. So 15 years in total, progressively worse. And at the worst, I was, um, I ended up in bed, unable to really do anything except drive my youngest one, who was a baby at the time, to her daycare. I would come back home and I would stay in bed the whole time. Um, just, you know, from the pain. Um, and that, you know... In addition to the pain, I had extreme fatigue. I was tired all the time. Um, anxiety, all the symptoms are kind of tying in together to the mind, body. Um, a lot of anxiety because, you know, I was trying um, to find through the medical traditional mm -hmm. road what was wrong with me, why I was experiencing the pain, why I wasn't able to walk why I had to stay in bed, why I couldn't lift up a cup from a shelf and yeah. pour myself a coffee wow. without needing help. Um, and, and, you know... And this was all as afterwards, after your scoliosis surgery. Yes, yes. So at that time, I've been, you know, as I went through different practitioners, I've spent about 15 years in physical therapy. So, you know, as you can imagine, financially, very draining, I've heard different, every physical therapist I've tried has been um, the best that was recommended for by my medical doctor at that time. Um, and they would give me different diagnosis and nothing was helping. It was helping for a little bit for like a session two. Um, and then the pain would return. Sometimes they would, the pain would return soon as I left the session. So it was very, very temporary relief. Um, I went through, you know, prescription because very often, you know, in the medical field, that's what you receive. I had a, my old family doctor prescribed me at that time, Tylenol 3, because she thought that was the only way I can get relief. Um, and just a quick fun fact, there's only 3% of people on whole earth that will get depression from Tylenol 3. Mm. And I was one of those three oh. person. <laughs> Yay, lucky you. Yes. So, uh, But at the same time, that was such a wake up moment for me because as I was depressed in the bed, it, that depression, like that was a week in, I quickly realized that's not normal. It's not normal to be feeling the way I was feeling, not getting the relief and it clue in there was, I felt there was something wrong. There has to be a better way. I have to figure that right. out. Um, yeah, so it was really eye-opening for me um, to go through the therapy, to go through the medications. Um, you know, when I ended up, um, I did ended up finding a physiotherapist who I did work as I was going through 
the last um, leg of the recovery, let me say it that way. Um, but at that, so at that time I was diagnosed with, you know, obviously I had spinal surgery. So that with the scoliosis, scoliosis is not corrected by spinal surgery. Um, just wanted to make sure everybody understand that because that's a, you know, we think we go through the surgery to correct scoliosis. Mm -hmm. It is corrected to a certain degree, but you, you won't get like a zero correction. There will still be scoliosis there. Right. Now, um, after, let's, let's clarify this as well. Yeah. Because some people, um, they think if, if they can see any type of curvature, you have scoliosis. Yeah. And to my knowledge, I don't believe that's accurate. Scoliosis is more of a bone growth issue. Um, did, have you seen my pictures? If you go to painfreeu.com. I, I a while back, down, like years ago like, when I found you. I was yeah. very crooked. And people yeah. were like, oh, you've got scoliosis. And I'm like... No, I've got no. imbalances that are pulling yeah. me out of alignment. Yeah. Yeah. That's not scoliosis because once I resolve the pain and the muscles loosened up, I'm you're going to. Yeah. So a lot of, you know, a lot of people get misdiagnosis. And even when you start looking into research, and that's something that I, I am so passionate about, you can. Even, you know, even you have a scoliosis or muscle imbalances, you can still correct it through, you know, through the daily movement, through, you know, the practices. Um, I've seen cases of especially kids that were recommended for surgery and through, you know, working with different types of practitioners, um, they were able to even out those imbalances, um, so, you know, it's a disservice. I, I don't want to say it's a disservice to go through the surgery. There's certain cases where probably it's needed. Um, but I know there's a lot of cases where it's not. And one of the one of my gurus, um, you probably have heard about about David Hanscom. Yeah, I know him. Yes, yeah, so he's like orthopedic surgeon out of states who, you know, he'll practice orthopedic surgery for, you know for the backs, for the back pain, for scoliosis, you know what I mean? Right. And he's now he's now talking about, you know, how it's actually like there's other ways around it. It really depends on your issue and where you where you fall into. So it's not a blanket prescription to get a surgery. Right? It's not going to resolve everything for you. It really depends on what you're looking for. Yeah. That's cool. All right. So tell me a little bit more about, um, you know, the journey, because you obviously figured yeah. out that PT wasn't helping, <clears throat> the medication wasn't helping, <clears throat> you ended up getting some side effects of depression from the um, the Tylenol 3, as you said. Mm -hmm. uh, what's where, where did that go from there? Yeah. Clearly yeah. what you found was you weren't getting answers. No. Yes. So you know, at that time when I got that Tylenol 3, I got um, so many different diagnoses. So I was told that I have arthritis, I had muscle, um, wasting muscle. So I had mm -hmm. no muscle in, you know, in specific areas. I had a peripheral na nerve injury. So I had a combination of symptoms. And to me, because I've spent years in physiotherapy and I've seen zero zero improvement i started i started researching right and through my research i came across you so i remember like reading your website reading your v like looking at your videos i came across tms wiki so at that point alan gordon had his program at tms wiki okay. and i started applying um his principle and his work at the same time as i was going to uh, physiotherapy. So I was going to physiotherapy three to four times a week. And every time I went, the sessions were focused on how, you know, I'm not walking properly. My body is not walking properly. And you're doing something wrong. Yes. And, and I was told how to correct my body, how, you know, when I'm sitting, I cannot cross my legs. I cannot lean. I cannot yeah, so you're, a you're lot of thought that you're not supposed to move unless it's perfect. Exactly. Right. How and as <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, it went on for a few months when I've tried both techniques and then I've decided I have to scale down on a physiotherapy. Like I had to significantly scale down and just apply 
the principles that I was learning from Alan's program. Mm -hmm. Because every time I went to physio, it would send those signals to my brain that my body doesn't know what to do, that I don't know how to sit. That yeah, I know you how can't to... really work both sides of the fence. No. You can't treat yourself yes. physically and then use a mind-body approach to convince mm -hmm. the brain that you're okay because the brain's going to go, but why are you still going to physio? There must be a body problem. You're going to question. Yeah. Exactly. Confusion in the brain is going to keep the brain on high alert and mm -hmm. keep symptoms going. So you have no, that's to exactly that's exactly how it happened. And you know, once I apply Alan's program, my recovery, like I want to say within probably two to three months, I was pain free. I've applied his pro. I don't want to say religiously because people will think it's a forced kind of. But, you know, I went to read other stories. I read how he explained. My biggest challenge was, and I still remember, with understanding outcome independence. And I think, you know, that's something that when we come from that environment where we thought you got to do things perfectly for your body to function, that outcome independence is just so difficult to get hold of and grasp and understand. Um, so I remember that what being a, what allowed you to get there. Cause some people are saying, mm -hmm. when you talk an outcome independence, you're telling me not to yep. care if I get better or not, but how can I not care if I get better or not? Because my life mm -hmm. is awful right now. So I've done a couple of you, things. How did you get there? Yeah. So I've done a couple of things. One of those things was because I was in bed and I wasn't literally our mailbox is, so we live on a street. Mm -hmm. Across the street, we have a mailbox from our house. Okay. I actually had to visualize. So one of the things getting there is I visualize every day, just getting, picking up mail and coming back. I didn't do any physical work. I didn't walk. I didn't get up to go even to the door. I just thought about how, you know, how I can walk. How will that look like? How will that feel like? Mm -hmm. Walking, picking up mail and coming back. And then I would start thinking about what if I walk just across the corner, just to my neighbor, and then I come back. And I've done that throughout the whole process. Even when I started walking, I would still visualize myself walking further before I start practicing that. Um, the second thing I've done was when I start practicing and actually walking, because that was very painful for me at that time, was... Sure. Focusing on my breath and just feeling my body as I walked without letting the pain scream at me. So acknowledging the pain for being there, but not, not letting it scream. Like, I mean, you know what I mean? So listening to my brain, but really staying in my body. Mm -hmm. I found that really worked for me. Um and just practicing gently, listening to my body gently in a gentle way without being overly persistent that I have to get hold of. I, I understood I have to get hold of outcome independence to get out of, you know, the hole I was in. But I didn't focus overly on that. Because I found that when I focus overly on that, I wanted to approach it like everything else I did before my my illness took over my life. I wanted to have a tick. I've done it perfectly. And that just doesn't work when it comes to our body. We have to just allow things to happen without trying to be perfect about it. Right. Right? Mm -hmm. And some days it worked in the beginning and some days it didn't. And then there was the next day that I got to practice. And regardless of, you know, if I got it right or not, that wasn't the purpose of me walking or practicing, right? There is no getting it right or not. Exactly. But yeah. but but coming from that perfectionist, as you know, as I applied the principle, it was okay, outcome independent. Let me practice. Let me get this one because I can get out of the pain, right? Yeah. And it's really not about that. It's really in a way surrendering, but I don't want to sound like we're letting go of our practice. It's it's really about reading, letting these things happen in a natural mm -hmm. kind of cycle, cycle in a natural way. 
you know, mm -hmm. the words surrender and acceptance uh, mm -hmm. tend to freak a lot of people out because mm -hmm. they think, well, that means I'm giving up. Give it up. Mm -hmm. Nope, 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 not at all. Mm -hmm. There's a big difference between acceptance of where you are right now, mm -hmm. surrendering to the process versus resignation that this is the rest of my life. I agree. Resignation and quitting are entirely different from mm -hmm. acceptance. It's like, mm -hmm. I have all of this pain and other symptoms and, you know, these certain things are extremely challenging for me. Mm -hmm. Accepting that is way better than trying to mm -hmm. resist it and fight it and hate it and focus yes. on it and despair over it and project this into the rest of your life. And um, so I think acceptance, surrender, um, are extremely valuable, mm -hmm. but don't convince yourself that you're quitting. You're not. You're just saying mm -hmm. where I am today is where I am today. But yep. you've also, you know, had somewhat of a plan going on to mm -hmm. to visualize. And once you did the visualization for a while and you started to practice seeing yourself doing things, mm -hmm. and you had enough, I wouldn't, I don't know, I guess bravery or mm -hmm. conviction. Mm -hmm. It's a belief, up. right? Yeah. Well, yeah. Mm -hmm. And the mm -hmm. belief builds over time because yeah. if you were to ask somebody brand new to this, okay, now visualize yourself walking. Do you think you'll be be able to do that? They'd be like, mm -hmm. get out of bed. What are you kidding? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. uh, I think the visualization was cool. Did you struggle with the visualization at first? So I have to tell you, yes. And hence my plan was initially to do in a small steps, right? Mm -hmm. So just crossing the street and practicing for, you know, and that may have been a couple of weeks before I moved to, over to, you know, to visualizing crossing, you know, going around the corner. So it's not a process where you can hit the targets or you can say, oh, this week I'm going to do this. Next week I'm going to start moving, you know, moving further down the street, it doesn't work that way. Um, I kind of see it the same way. This is why physical therapy sometimes doesn't work, especially on people like us. It doesn't work on people like us because it's not that prescription where we can say we want our body to do things in particular way at particular time, right? It's just- yeah. My opinion is physical therapy doesn't work because it's not a body problem. No, it's not. It's, it's, it's not the brain creating mm -hmm. the symptoms to keep us mm -hmm. safe. Where are you more safe than in bed? Yeah. Right. Your brain doesn't want you to move because who knows it, at some point the brain came up with, whether it be a conscious thought or a subconscious yeah. belief that, wow, I got screwed up by the surgery. Cause otherwise how, how come I would, there's no other reason I'd be hurting if it wasn't the surgery. Cause you said there was not really much. Yeah. Beforehand. I, I was fine beforehand. I was even fine after surgery. I think it's really, you know, my life got so busy. I got so many demands going on as a busy mom, as a climbing career ladder. Um, I got a lot of promotions at work happening very quickly. I do feel like staying in bed was, you know, probably my brain was thinking it's the safest, most comfortable thing for me to do. And what as our brains are looking for that safety, for that comfort, right? Question. When mm -hmm. the symptoms finally started, mm -hmm. was there any conscious belief that said, holy cow, maybe the surgery went bad or something went wrong with the surgery? Or did you think, mm -hmm. well, it's not the surgery, it's something else, but I don't know what else. I'm curious where they're. Yeah. Where so they I didn't. Was. Yeah. So I didn't think the surgery went well went wrong but my thought has been always i didn't need the surgery it wasn't necessary for me so, so how, that, much re how much regret and second guessing yourself was there for that so for me there was actually a lot because i was 16 15 when i had the surgery oh, wow. so obviously you know um i saw orthopedic surgeon they tell you you are borderline between brace or a surgery but you will ended up having needing a surgery anyway in a year or two there wasn't i didn't feel like there was enough of a you know of a consent there or enough of the education on my part you know this is we're talking about 90s as well back in poland so there was no internet no way to research no way to talk to somebody way I ahead of you 
Yeah. Right. That's when I went through. Um, it. Yes. So, um, even you know, so for me, definitely the surgery was if if I could take it, I would not have a surgery, regardless of how my back looks like, because I truly believe working with the brain working on the muscle imbalances no matter how your back looks like is you know it's it's just something you can do for yourself i always strong you know and looking also at the research studies right like there's so many people with disc disc herniations with different backs walking around with no pain exactly and enjoying their lives right um so my biggest part of my story and why I'm so passionate about sharing is through, you know, once I've recovered, so I want to add to that story a little bit because there's a fun yeah. twist in it. Well, you didn't once really, I, have, I mean, you, we you didn't finish yet. The visualization, but, you know, let's get to the recovery. Yeah. Once I've recovered, that recovery lasted for six months. And then, then I was in a car accident with my whole family. Wow. And after that car accident, it was a bit, it was a bit, sorry. So um, it was right on the highways, I think freeways in the States. So it wasn't a minor hidden run. It was a bit of an accident. I was with our kids. My husband got very, very scared because, he, you know, of my back. I'm kind of, you know, that person in the family. I had scoliosis. I have roads. So it still was a bit of a bubble around me, making sure nothing happened to me. Okay. By any chance, we have to go to the hospital and deal with my rods or something else there. So after that car accident, I found my recovery actually. Um, so my pain returned. I wasn't able, I was able to walk a little bit better than the first time around. I didn't have to lie down. I, I didn't spend time in bed except, you know, when I needed the rest throughout the day, which I still needed quite a lot. So I regressed like a lot in terms of, you know, I was able to, before that car accident, do a lot of things. And I had to stay at home, be off work, stay in bed, rest a lot, sit only for 10 minutes at a time. Um, there was a piece of where I did attend physical therapy just from that acute injury right after the car accident, but I've applied PRT, so pain reprocessing right away. I knew what's going on. I knew my brain, it's just on a high alert. Something happened. And at that time, I also, that's when I started questioning my surgery. That's when I started to, you know, thinking about my back. Mm -hmm. um, did something happen? Like we were in a car accident. It wasn't a small car accident. I've been previously in my life in two car accidents. Mm -hmm. So this was my third one. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, all these things come in, right, to the surface, like, why did it happen? Like, did I have, did we have to drive? Did we have to visit parents, my parents-in-law? You know, and all of these thoughts are just not helpful, like, because they trigger our brain into, you know, right. in, yeah. So that recovery took me over a year. It took me longer than that initial one. Mm -hmm. um, and to make it things more interesting four months after that recovery I was in another car accident oh jeez wow I seem to be a person people like hitting behind wow um, but from that car accident I walked in right away they bumped us and right away I knew this is not happening I said to myself this is not happening I am fine I am safe. Mm -hmm. um, and there were two takeaways that, or kind of two messages that came to me at that moment. Um, one of them was that, you know, I've been just sitting in the sidelines, not sharing the recovery story, how, you know, how mind body techniques, how powerful they are. Mm -hmm. um, and my second message was um, just to work on strengthening my body because that wasn't something that was never something I focused on, but I'm like, well, down the road, if there was another one, I just want to feel stronger. Not that I wasn't feeling stronger, but that was kind of the thing I wanted to focus as my goal. Um, but throughout the whole experience, as my husband dealt with insurance, he's, you know, he dealt with the person that hit us as I was sitting there, 
I was applying, you know, the messages of safety. I said to myself, I will walk away. This is nothing. It's just a bump. Somebody just touched our, like literally somebody just touched our car. It's insignificant. Mm -hmm. My body is strong. I am safe. Nothing's happening. Um, And I sat and did that as I, you know, breath, did the breathing, very slow breathing, very relaxed breathing. I started in the parasympathetic nervous system. When we got home, I just did a bit of a like anti-inflammatory drink because, you know, soon as after the car accident, your body will kind of release a little bit of the anti, you know, inflammatory. It will have an inflammatory response. So I'm like, okay, I'll take care of the inflammatory response. I don't want to be in physio. I'll go and, you know, I'll go have a massage if I need to, but I just don't want to do what I've done previously. Right. And that worked really well. So, so I didn't no, have to. There was no onset of pain or anything? That no, out. nothing. I, you know. That shows how our response to mm-hmm. any incident or or pain symptoms It shows our response will determine whether or not the brain keeps the symptoms going, Mm -hmm. settles them down, or Mm -hmm. whether or not the brain even brings them up in the first place. Your immediate clarity to go, oh, we're not doing this again. There's nothing wrong. Mm -hmm. I'm fine, et cetera, et cetera. That's why you didn't have any onset of pain then. Mm -hmm. Didn't run into a problem. However, if you freaked out, Mm -hmm. oh, no, here we go again. Mm -hmm most likely Mm -hmm. would have ended up back into a situation where you had to kind of dig yourself out of a hole. So brilliant. That's awesome. Totally. And the way, so the way I reflect on that moment, it was like when we are on the plane and we need, you know, or in any accident, we need CPR to me, that was my PRT CPR right there on the moment. What do you do in the, you know, when you go through the injury, when something happens, you you do CPR when it's that critical to me, that was that critical. I applied right away. Um, and, you know, there's been other instances popping in through my life. Like, this is not a work that we just do. We close it and we find for the rest of our lives. Um, you know, I do go right now currently through the strength training. I've been almost a year in there. And I do remember in the beginning going through the exercises that I've been told in a physical therapy I will not be able to ever do or lift more than two pounds of weight. And I'm currently at like five to seven pounds. So, you know, I do remember getting the new exercises from my coach and thinking, no way I can do this. And then, right? So the brain will default to what is familiar. Mm -hmm. That familiar doesn't mean it's the best thing for us. It's very often it's not. So I, you know, I have to click in and say, no, no, no. This is not happening. I I hear you. I know it's safe. I know I can do it. Just because I'm trying, it, you know, it it doesn't mean I'm going to get injured by it. It's a safe exercise. Yeah. People are doing it everywhere. I love what Dr. Zarna <laughs> used to say many, many years ago. Uh, when people would come into his office, patients, and they would, <clears throat> I threw my back out by lifting something too heavy, Mm -hmm. his answer was, if it was too heavy, you wouldn't have been able to pick it up. Yep. So Mm -hmm. um, the story that says, oh no, seven pound weight. Mm -hmm. Remember they told me I wouldn't be able to lift two. And the old story brings up the perception of danger. And then if you weren't clear on it, and if you didn't counter that with some more accurate, no, I can do this. But if you bought into the fact that, oh, my coach wants me to Mm -hmm. lift seven pounds, and if you stayed in fear and were terrified of it, your brain likely Mm -hmm. would have said, ouch, don't do that. Yeah. So the clarity in the moment, this is not a, this is not a recovery process that takes this much time. Mm -hmm. Recovery process filled with little moments of clarity and Mm -hmm. decision, period. You can't mm-hmm. recover a month from now. Mm-hmm. All you can do is make better decisions right now in the moment. And most of this happens between our two ears. Like mm-hmm. this is a thinking recovery process. It is. Because the thinking will either 
perpetuate the fear and the brain's perception of danger or the thinking, which you've done very well at the right times, perpetuated a feeling of, no, I'm, I'm, I'm okay, I'm safe. Mm -hmm. So this is a moment by moment recovery process. You can't fix yourself a month or two months mm -hmm. out from now. It's not a two month recovery process. It's a right now, what am I doing? Am I, am yeah. I feeding the danger or you know creating safety, period. So focus on the now, which is beautiful. And you've done that very well. Totally. And I think there's a lot of the misconceptions or maybe not misconceptions. We are just taught in our traditional medical practice, right? When we see the doctor, you you have a pill, you take the pill, you feel better. So there's that expectations of, you know, I apply it, I apply it, I apply it. It should work, right? So I remember even going through my that first um recovery trying the different you know different ways of you know if i do this can i walk if i do this can i sit for a little bit more than 10 minutes um and it just doesn't work that way it's just like you said it's as it happens in the moment notice it and act on it and and bring that better thought in so that your brain feels safe and doesn't you know bring your old thinking in, right? That fear into your body. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. All right. So where are you today? You feel good? Great. I feel really good. I haven't had a pain episode in like forever. I don't even remember. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I can sit as long as I want to sit. There's no, you know, in, I remember to the days of you know, that first recovery where I could only sit for 10 minutes. So I have a, my Garmin watch has a timer and I had a timer set up for 10 minutes and I had to stand when I was working. What a way to teach our brain that it's only safe to sit for 10 minutes and anything longer than 10 minutes. Obviously, it will ring that alarm bell in I, your I brain, yeah. right? So I had to learn how to give that out and not focus on it. I can sit now, anytime, as long as I want. I can sit on any chair. There's still chair preference. There's still some chairs that I just prefer better than others. Let's be honest. No, but just from a comfort perspective. For sure. Like right? when you go to the uh, the yeah. office supply store and yeah. you want to pick out a chair. You, you sit, sit and it feels bad. Them. You yes. sit in 20 of them and go, oh, this is awful. That's awful. Yeah. Too. Oh, this is kind of okay. Let's remember yeah. this. Let me try six more. And yeah. after a while, you're like, this one just feels the best. That's normal. Yeah. That's expected. Yeah. Just like you go to the mattress exactly. store and you try yeah. a bunch of mattresses. It's not that any of them are safer yeah. than the others. Yep. And I well, know people with foot pain and they're like, I've bought 200 pairs of shoes over the past three years. I yeah. can't wear certain shoes. And I'm like, well, some shoes are definitely more comfortable than others, but others. of them are dangerous enough to create the pain that you're yeah. experiencing. Yeah. So it's amazing how the, the subconscious brain will mm -hmm. just latch on to, uh-oh, that's dangerous. Uncomfortable means dangerous. No, 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 it doesn't. So that's great. So yeah. you're able to sit. For as long as you yeah, want. Yeah, I can sit as long as I want. I can go for a walk. I can walk. I can, you know, I paddleboard in the summer, which was something that to me, like, no way I could ever imagine myself paddleboarding. And, okay. you know, right now I'm at the seven pounds. I know it may seem insignificant to some people. I'm celebrating. I'm loving the program I'm working on. It's challenging my brain in a new way, too. Although I've done the work, I can apply the work, I can explain it to others. I get, you know, from time to time when I get a new exercise, new movement, it's like, oh, oh. I'm like, no, this is fine. I know I can do it. It's all fine. Yeah. Because your body is actually not in trouble. Exactly. Surgery like healed years and years ago. The car yes. accidents, if there was an injury, have healed long ago. Yeah. And you're perfectly fine now. What you're doing is teaching. Mm -hmm. right? There is no healing to do now. No, there, there. It, now it's There's just brain remembering. Yeah. yeah, consistent messages of safety. Consistently yeah. staying out of the freakout zone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You're doing wonderful. 
Anything else yeah. you want to share? What would you say to somebody who is dealing with either scoliosis mm -hmm. and they're blaming their pain on that mm -hmm. or somebody who just has some other type of symptoms mm -hmm. that are most likely related to this whole mind body aspect so i would say scoliosis and herniated disc because herniated discs are so prevalent and so many people are diagnosed with herniated discs and they blame the pain on herniated disc i would highly recommend for them to try any of the mind body techniques um, and trust the process and um, work with somebody and I would recommend work with somebody I personally work with somebody I've tried on myself but I did work with somebody I had a coach at that time as well mm -hmm. um, you know um, and that may look differently for different people but I know there's a lot of people also providing a lot of free information a lot of free content um, so there's really you know there's an amazing opportunity for someone who's actually who wants to get better to mm -hmm. get better and it's really about the commitment to that daily work, noticing your thoughts and learning how to switch yeah. from that negative, from what your brain wants to, you know, feel safe in, into a new way of thinking and doing things. Okay. Yeah, it is a commitment. Um, you know, I have people, you know, say to me, you know, I've been doing this mind body mm -hmm. work for six months and I'm <clears> still not any better this stuff doesn't work. And I'm like, okay. So that frustration, the fear, the impatience, yeah. all of that. Of, it's, I was like, is that teaching your brain that you're safe? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. No, not at all. And do you still find yourself freaking out or are you consistently reminding yourself you're safe? Oh, I'll freak out once in a while. And I'm like, all right, great. But then the next day, when you try to convince yourself you're safe, your brain's going to look at you and go, yeah, but yesterday you were in a complete panic. Mm -hmm. So the brain doesn't know what to believe. So, yeah, and I totally agree. I, I spoke recently to a lady who's been doing this for three years and she's in a despair. She doesn't see way out and she's still experiencing all the symptoms. And I do remember how it was when I went initially through my journey uh, because you're in so much pain and that pain is such a strong stimulus. It's, you know, obviously we want to get out of it. Obviously we want to feel the break, but all of that feeds into, you know, into that pain cycle, right? Um and, you know, so it's really, you know, learning on how to, again, surrender. And I just, I don't want to repeat myself, but surrender, trust the process, apply the work with a lot of, you know, being gentle to yourself, I guess it's my main message, yeah. because we cannot apply that work trying to be perfect. It's not going to work. It sure. will be trial. Exactly. It will be a trial and error. It will work some days, not other days. Be consistent. Try your best without, you know, without this practice becoming a work. As soon as it becomes a work where you feel like, oh, I have to go do it, that feeds into that cycle too. Right. Uh, so being really gentle and trying to figure it out a way that you can, you know, you can progress a little bit every day without putting too much of a strain on your nervous system because right. that will trigger yeah, having expectations that mm -hmm. I know all about this stuff, so I should be better already. Mm -hmm. That's not how it works, mm -mm. right? The knowledge mm -hmm. alone is extremely useful. Mm -hmm. So that you can, often, you can reinforce. Yeah, well, the accurate mm -hmm. knowledge is a very useful tool for lowering mm -hmm. fear because you can authentically reassure yourself that I'm fine and I'm going to be mm -hmm. fine. This is temporary. Um, that's why I always start with the foundation of what's causing symptoms and does that apply to me? And once you get those two foundational items, it becomes easier, but it's not easy and it's not, mm -hmm. the knowledge is a great starting point and it is the foundation. You got to stand on a solid foundation, but it does take time, patience, consistency, mm -hmm. clarity, you know, uh, eventually get to the point where you're just, mm -hmm freaking out less and less to the point where you don't freak out anymore because you know exactly what's going on. 
So I have one more tip. I remember, I just remember when I used to freak out in those moments where you kind of feel you applied and it's brains taking over. What I Mm. used to do is I used to actually go and listen to other people's success stories, Mm -hmm. especially the people. So I would focus specifically on the scenarios very similar to me. So I didn't, you know, I couldn't find anybody with scoliosis at that time who, you know, but I found people with that degenerative disc. And Mm -hmm. I would focus on those success stories, you know, seeing that others can do it have helped me see that, you know, I can apply and I can as well heal and get better. Okay. So I will say that, yes, if you can find a success story that matches your symptoms, Mm -hmm. that can be extremely powerful. However, if you cannot just understand that uh, everybody who's gotten better with this mind body approach Mm -hmm did it with the same exact process teach them yep. that i'm not really broken so i don't think of the probably you know hundreds of different symptoms that we've got hundreds of different solutions we don't we don't mm-hmm. and i don't think you need to find an exact match to your symptom in order to get better would it be nice absolutely but mm-hmm. if you cannot find somebody with this one mm-hmm. weird odd symptom you've got that does mm-hmm. not remove it from being a body symptom it still is and there's ways of finding that out Mm -hmm. you know assessments that i talk about all the time Mm -hmm. you know your solution is your solution but it's probably the same solution as somebody else even if the symptom is you know presenting differently i totally agree so you know when when me when I start looking at that you know degenerative disc because I couldn't find scoliosis but look where I ended up I applied whatever you know success story from degenerative discs to my own particular scenario, which you know with all my different diagnoses I wouldn't be able to find anybody like people were blown away when I came to even physical therapy because they're like you're like one in a million with everything you have, sure. so if. I, you know what I mean? So I kind of applied whatever I could find Mm -hmm. to help myself, right? And to kind of reinforce. And so the other message is around, you know, understanding, and I know you just said that, um, understanding, you know, how, you know, how we can apply the methods and and how that works with brain is so super helpful. Anytime we have that negative thought, it's really about, oh, this is what's happening, yeah. So it's not just knowing how to, you know, how the mind-body techniques works. It's just re- really recognizing when it's happening to you, for like for you. And then, oh, this is what's happening. And then applying them, right? And as soon as we can do that, the easier then that journey mm-hmm. becomes. Yeah, I think our ability to observe what is happening mm-hmm. And connect some dots and go, I'm in a big flare up. Things are really bad. Okay, observe. Mm -hmm. What are my conscious thoughts? What are those thoughts creating? Are they creating a lot of fear and despair and worry? And, Mm -hmm. you know, like observe and connect the dots, (laughs) excuse me, between how I'm feeling physically with symptoms and where's my mindset? Because often- Mm -hmm you will find a direct Mm -hmm. correlation. Now, there are some cases, and for the people who go, yeah, but I can't connect the dots because there is none. Out of the blue, all Mm -hmm. of a sudden, my symptoms are way worse. And what I tell them is, you know, you're not always going to be able to figure it out and connect the dots. This is a process that's really run by the subconscious brain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But keep in mind, the conscious brain also has a role in it. So the Mm -hmm. only thing we can do is influence and make better decisions with our conscious brain. And if we can do that consistently, the subconscious will eventually climb on board and Mm -hmm. follow your conscious lead. Mm -hmm. Um, We can't, you know, people are like, yeah, but I wake up in pain. How do I solve that with your conscious brain? How are you responding? What are your Mm -hmm. expectations when you go to sleep? Are you telling yourself, I wake up with pain every morning? That's a program. It is literally a program that says, Hey, brain, I'm waking up. Go turn on the pain. Like your expectations create what the brain does. It's called predictive coding. 
predictive coding is that the brain can literally mm -hmm. create something that you expect out of blue, out of thin air, out of the blue. So if you expect to hurt every morning, most likely you're going to hurt. Mm -hmm. so we want to go to bed expecting better. And if we wake up in the morning and we do hurt, we can say, oh, the brain's still on that old habit. It's a conditioned response. We don't have mm -hmm. to keep doing this. So brain, shh, I'm actually okay. I'm not mm -hmm. concerned. Remember all that stuff we've learned? Let's work together on this. Let's 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 form a team here. I'm going to show you that I'm okay because I'm going to get up and start my day. Mm -hmm. And you see how between expecting better and then responding better, over time, the brain's going to go, wow, look at Agnes. She's not afraid. Mm -hmm. Maybe I don't need to be either subconscious mm -hmm. brain. And I don't think we actually like in those flare ups. I can relate. I've been there. You, we, you know, our rational brain is trying to go through the different scenarios. I did this. I've reached for this cup. I did this. I maybe I leaned over. We actually don't have to find why it happened. What's the purpose? What's you know? What's the reason for our pain? Um, and I think that is like one of the hardest things because our logical brain wants to link our pain to out. why we have it, right? It's trying to figure out just like that puzzle, right? Once we feel like we figure it out, we put the puzzle, puzzle pieces together, we have it. Then, you know, we'll avoid the movement. We'll, but that's you know, not there's a solution. Way. Exactly. And so we don't have to actually find the solution to apply it and be successful in the recovery. Every time you figure out reaching for this cup or bending over mm -hmm. or something caused my pain and now you add it to your list called things to avoid mm -hmm. the problem is you're shrinking your world and all you're doing is confirming the brain's perception that bending over or <coughs> reaching for a cup is dangerous mm -hmm. so don't do it anymore mm -hmm. that's the opposite of what we want to do mm -hmm. if you reach for a cup and your your brain goes ouch that's when you go I just picked up a darn cup. Come on, this is not a big deal. I, I'm I'm capable. I'm strong. Mm -hmm. right? You're overprotective. I'm not doing mm -hmm. anything wrong here. Mm -hmm. So, number one, we can't always figure it out because sometimes the subconscious mm -hmm. is perceiving something as dangerous that's really not. Um, but even if we do figure it out, don't start that list of things to avoid because all that does is come. Mm -hmm. fear yeah, and the belief that you're frail and easily broken, and there's a perfect way to move. Because mm -hmm. all that that doesn't really lead to recovery. That leads to mm -hmm. drinking. Yep. Agree. Beautiful stuff. Anything else you'd like to add? Um I you know, it's beautiful to live, and I know you know that, to live a life where pain is not controlling, it's not playing a role. Um, and I, I do true, you know, feel it's possible for everybody. It's yeah. possible for everybody. Yeah. There is mm -hmm. life after chronic pain. Mm -hmm. And as I've said in a video a long time ago, there's life after chronic pain and it's a fantastic it's life. It's amazing. It's better but than before. If you can wake up to the point where you say, what do I want to do today? What mm -hmm. do I need to do today? And the word pain doesn't even enter your mind. Mm -hmm. That's where you can get to. You don't have mm -hmm. to get up and say, how do I navigate the day so I don't cause more pain? Mm -hmm. you're not out of it yet. This is not recovering from symptoms, from pain. Mm -hmm. It is truly a recovery from fear. Mm -hmm. because I have zero fear about symptoms, mm -hmm. zero. And if I get mm -hmm. a tweak and things are a little bit sensitive, zero fear, zero attention. Yep. I call it out for what it is. I know what it is and I'm not concerned. And I show my brain I'm not concerned because I don't focus on it. And then I go about my day and nothing becomes chronic. Mm -hmm. So it's really not recovering from symptoms. It's recovering from the fear and the perception of danger that's mm -hmm. driving the symptoms. So um, I know you mentioned you do a little mm -hmm. bit of coaching yourself. Would you like to share how people can reach you? Because I don't do any one-on-one -on -one coaching. I have a, a wonderful okay. group program. Um, but if anybody's looking for uh, some one-on-one -on -one help, yep. And Agnes's story uh, resonates with you. How can they get in touch with you? Yeah, sure. So they can find me on Instagram at the Simple Beautiful Wellness. That's probably the easiest way. Um, 
I, if I can actually mention, I will have a, I'm not sure when you're going to air it out and I will have a free challenge coming up um, end of January, January 22nd. If anybody's interested, they can join in. Okay. So um, they can follow your channel. Yeah. Yes. They'll, they'll find all the details. The simple, I have a beautiful, the wellness. simple, beautiful wellness. Yes. I have a Facebook group um, where, you know, I upload PRT um, scripts, meditation. I like to call them meditations. People can relate to it. Um, so there's a lot of value, free value for people to come in and beautiful grab it and learn from it. All right. That's great. Yeah. So for anybody who, um, you know, feels they'd like to work with Agnes, you can check her out on Instagram. And she and I have actually spoken about doing a live stream mm -hmm. on her Instagram channel. Mm -hmm. uh, at some point in the next month or two, we'll, we'll get that mm -hmm. scheduled and do that. So if you're following her Instagram, uh, you'll probably see her announce that if you'd like yes. to come and uh, watch us do a live stream. So that'd be amazing. Anything else to add? Um, you know, the life after pain, it's amazing. I could not, I remember going through the journey. I remember seeing your videos and you mentioning and seeing others mentioning. And it was such an out of reach concept for me at that time. Right. But it, you know, being where I am, looking backwards now and helping others, it's just, it's unbelievable. There's really no constraint. The pain doesn't enter my universe, doesn't enter. And just like you said, you know, on the days where, you know, maybe I did a bigger workout or something, it, you know, it's it's normal. Mm -hmm. It's natural that we will feel muscles and we will feel different things, but it's really not anything that you know i pay attention to or i'm preoccupied with sure. or that is you know impacting my life and you know we've been sitting here for now hour and a half i think that's a great testimonial as well <laughs> i haven't moved for where i am oh, about an hour we about an hour okay yeah. yeah i don't see the time here it feels yeah, it's we've about, been for a while yeah, yeah it's about 11 east coast time so yeah. uh, okay about an hour but um, listen, I really appreciate you sharing your story. Um, what's interesting, though, is, mm -hmm. you know, we were kind of pointing towards scoliosis mm -hmm. as your recovery journey. But in hindsight, was it really the scoliosis that that was the challenge? And oh, by the way, you yeah. had scoliosis and maybe for functional reasons, you decided yeah. to get the surgery. And it went well and you felt well. Yeah. And it was only later that symptoms came out. So yeah. I don't know. Is this a scoliosis success story or is it really just a mind body? It is mind body. It is it is mind body. If if I went to talk to traditional doctors, they would tell me it's a scoliosis, it's arthritis, it's perin peripheral nerve damage recovery, it's a herniated disc recovery. So you know, I've applied the mind body techniques to all of the conditions I had because I looked at as my last hope, my last resort of getting killed. Nothing in the traditional medical system worked. I was on a lot of anti-inflammatories mm -hmm. every you know, two weeks prescription. After that Tylenol-3, I was getting other medication. Nothing worked. So to me, it's really mind body applied to. Um, I like to highlight the scoliosis because a lot of my coaching clients are clients with scoliosis where they cannot sit well, nice fireworks <laughs> look at that yeah it's weird yeah. uh zoom has these weird features features that if you do certain mm -hmm. things like a thumbs up mm -hmm. oh there's a thumbs up this one's kind of cool look at that yeah yeah two thumbs so i up. like I think that's yeah hard. i like to highlight wow highlight you know the scoliosis and the different diagnosis to show them what's possible yeah because a lot of people, when we just bring in the mind body, they may not even think that that can be applied. Just, you know, where you have the structural, structural mm -hmm. issues, as you've been told by your medical doctor. And I think there's like such a huge opportunity for people to learn about it, apply it and get better. Yes, for sure. All mm -hmm. right. Beautiful. Agnes, thank you so much. I really thank appreciate you, Dan. sharing your story. 
I look forward to connecting with you in a month or so whenever we schedule that Instagram live. Uh, and if we can figure out how to do it, um, I may Sounds figure out how to stream it on my channel at the same time, although I don't know if we'll do that. If not, I think in Instagram allows you to record it too, right? Yeah, it does. It does. So if not, then I'll probably see if I can get a copy of that recording. I'll figure it out. My community as well. Yeah, I'll figure it out. Brilliant. And by the way, don't forget, folks, uh, if you're interested in her challenge, that'll probably be the end of January. So follow her at The Simple Beautiful Wellness on Instagram. And uh, I appreciate you. And everybody, thanks for watching. And we'll catch you in the next success story. Actually, Thank you so much. as I always say, uh, as usual, I'll see you tomorrow with my daily videos. So appreciate you. Thank thanks. you, Dan.